Tracy Bell, my husband Craig and I started Ripple Rock Fish Farms in 2013 and we raise about 40,000 pounds of tilapia a year. So we are located in Frasiesburg, Ohio in a 6,000 square foot building on our property and we when we started, we received some good advice from the professors at Cornell University who told us that you've got to grow gradually. Don't bite off a lot at first. And so we took that to heart. We started with a 3000 gallon system, fingerling system, and we raised about a thousand pounds of fish the first year. And then the next year, I think we were at about 10,000 pounds and we've grown gradually ever since. So. Now in 2021, we hope to exceed 40,000 pounds this year. So Craig and I are from Los Angeles. We're city kids and we moved here. He had a corporate job working in higher education and facilities and he traveled a lot. <clears throat> and at the time we had four kids. This was in like 2011. And one of our, our daughter was a little special needs gal in a wheelchair and she had a lot of needs and he was on the road all the time and he came home one week after being gone all week and i said we have got to do something different <laughs> and so he um he was willing he said yeah fine figure out something different so i started researching i have a finance background and i started researching what kinds of things can we do without moving and I came across aquaculture and I called the um, Ohio South Centers down in Piketon. They have free tours and we went on a tour there and, and uh, started exploring what that means to be in aquaculture. And uh, I thought he has a facilities background and I can crunch the numbers. And so that's how we kind of got started. And we had kids to, to teach how to work. <laughs> <laughs> and so we put them to work. We started building a building in 2013. We went to the short course on aquaculture at Cornell University. It was a week long course um, with Dr. Timmons and Dr. Ebling and got to know them and uh, really started to study about the industry and the needs and realized that this was a, had potential for growth and, and a need in the United States to raise seafood on a significant level. So when we went to the short course at Cornell, they took us on a tour of their facilities there and um, they showed us a design plan for a dual drain um, system that they had on paper. And Craig asked them, he said, can we go see one of these? And they smiled and said, well, we don't have one. This is just on paper, this is our idea. And so a few weeks later, I was on the list serve for the um, uh, local aquaculture group here and a grant possibility came across on the list serve. And so I called the professors at Cornell and I said, hey, what if we wrote a grant for your system and we'll be the test facility, we'll be the um, researchers. And so they said, yeah. And so that's kind of how we got started with the system that we have using the idea from um, research here locally that many aquaculture businesses fail because of the high initial cost to get into the business. And this uh, system that the professors had designed is a kind of a DIY. It's, it's, using, it's not using the expensive fiberglass tanks that are um, typically what people use when they get in and they're expensive. And so this was a build it yourself raceway um, from two by sixes and, and uh, a roofing liner. And so we put together this uh, idea. Uh, so so we, we created the proposal for the SBIR grant to build tanks ourselves. And that is really how we ended up with the system that we have. We wrote manuals to help other people get started so that every fish farmer that gets into this business does not have to reinvent the wheel. And that was the idea that um, uh, drove the proposal, the grant proposal that we put together. We wrote the grant, it, the, it took about a year to write the grant. It's uh, over a hundred pages long. 
it's a book. <laughs> and the professors helped a great deal. So did the uh, collaboration with OSU and South Centers in Piketon. So we all worked together on it. And uh, the, after it was submitted, you wait another several months, four months or so. And then we heard back that it was turned down. We didn't get the grant. And of course we were disappointed. And the professors called me and said, let's rewrite it. And I said, no, thanks. I'm done. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm kind of burned out on this. And they said, no, no, we can do this. We can rewrite it. And so we took the reviewer's notes and rewrote it and waited another year. And then the, um, the word came that we were granted the, the, the money and the, the funds to put this idea together. So it was a couple years. We did kind of set up a little tank and do a little practice around just to see if we could grow fish while we were waiting for the grant um, results. Um, but it was a couple years before we really got started. And, and then to get started, we had to build the building first and then build the tanks. So it, it, was a, it was several years in the making. The time frame from when we first had the idea in 2011, we wrote a grant that got us to 2013. We built the building and started selling fish probably mid 2014. Uh, we probably were in the black by mm, 2018. <laughs> so it's, it was, it was a um, process and a lot of learning curve, which is why we wrote manuals, hoping that maybe we could save others some of the struggle. We considered different types of fish. Perch can be grown and raised in these systems. Trout can. Uh, as we researched the area in Columbus, um, there, is, there was a high demand for tilapia. So it, and they are just a little bit more forgiving. And because we were new to the field, we thought that that would be a good fit. <laughs> so when we started, we had every intention of doing the food fish. That was our plan so that we could provide a year round uh, consistent supply of fish. What we didn't realize after we got started was people started calling us and, and asking if we would sell them pond fish because uh, tilapia do a great job of cleaning up algae in a pond. We didn't know that. We started having golf courses and, and country clubs calling us in the springtime. And so that first year it caught us off guard and uh, going forward, we started planning on that. So in about November, we load up our inventory with the idea of selling a six inch fish in May. We broke ground in 2013. We put our kids to work and we built this ourselves. Um, it probably, t it was a work in progress for a couple of years of putting the tanks together. As soon as we would get one system started, we would get fish in them and let them grow. And then we'd try to stay ahead of that to grow the, to build the next system in time to move the fish on. <laughs> so we just tried to stay one step ahead of the growing fish. This is where we live. And so we knew that in order to be successful, it needed to be where Craig could have his eyes on it all the time. It feels like a dairy farm, sort of. And so that's how we decided. And tilapia, we chose tilapia because they lend themselves very well to this recirculating system that we'd chosen. We're on a well. Originally, we had one well that we dug for the building. And then as our production increased, we dug a second well. So we have two now. We do have to monitor the temperature of the water. We have a, um, a water heating system that is in place. We use natural gas to heat it. We have a well on our property, so we do have um, net access to natural gas in that way, so that's helpful. Um, but what we find now, especially in the winters, as, the, as we heat the water in the tanks, that naturally heats the building. And so uh, as we close it all up for winter, um, the water heat heats the building. We try to keep it between about 77 to 80 degrees. In the summer, it actually gets warmer than that. And we find that the fish just grow faster in the summer. 
What we do with the water when it comes into the system, we have a holding tank and we pump the well water into the holding tank so that it can start to warm up before we need it because well water is coming out at 56 degrees, I believe. And that's real cold for our tilapia. So we do put it in a storage tank a day before, let it get to room temperature. And then in the winter, we'll heat it a little bit more from there. We order about 6,000 fish every six weeks and they are about an inch, about a half a gram. And they come from New Mexico, from an A plus breeder in New Mexico. And so we pick them up at the airport, they fly in overnight and we pick them up in boxes at the airport. Yeah, they call us and they say, your fish are here. And so we go pick them up at the airport. They're in a couple big bags in boxes. Yeah, so we have two different systems, a fingerling system, um, that takes them when as soon as they arrive and they'll stay there oh about 16 weeks and then we move them to the raceways for grow out and that at, at that point we sort them as well so that they're kind of uniform in size. We have built four raceways they're about 11,000 gallons um, and they hold anywhere from four to five thousand fingerlings to grow out market size. We built this system and we've we have design plans and manuals on how to operate it. And it really is just basically uh, two by sixes that build the framework lined with a roofing liner and, um, and uh, insulated. And it, it's really not a complicated uh, design plan, um, but it is very cost effective and it's getting the job done. They, the other thing that's different about these raceways is that in a lot of aquaculture facilities, you'll see round tanks. And these are different because these are rectangular, which you, better utilizes the square footage. And um, with the circulating system that we have, it creates, it's a mixed cell raceway is what they call it. And we have three circular um, uh, water flows within that rectangle. And so it creates that um, circular drain. There's three drains, center drains, in those um, raceways. And so it creates the, uh, the flow to pull the waste out quickly, just like in a round tank, but using square footage more efficiently. On a day-to-day -day basis, we uh, backwash the filter systems. We have bead, bead uh, washed filters, and they are backwashed every morning. Um, we exchange about five to 10% of the water in those raceways every day. We load feeders, we test the chemicals, uh, check the um, ammonia and nitrites, uh, pH and temperature, oxygen levels. Those are all things that we monitor on a daily basis and record so that we can track those things. So we, um, we do have a YSI monitor that will monitor all of the um, oxygen levels and, and temperature. We do the chemical, we test the chemicals by hand um, and do the, the uh, backwashes by hand. Feeding, we have a whole um, spreadsheet that our son designed on Excel to monitor the growth of the fish every day and when we're pulling fish out to sell them and when we're um, starting a new cohort of fish and it will calculate the change of feed rates every day so that the guys will print out a sheet once a week and it'll tell them how much to feed each tank. And so we load the fish or we load the feeders uh, every morning and then uh, they're on timers to, to drop four times a day. So when we pull the fish, happens every Tuesday. We get orders from our stores on Monday and then we um, we have uh, grater bars that we run through the raceway that will help the fish gather at one end, the larger fish, the ones that are market ready, which is about a pound and a half. And then the guys will net those and do a final sorting and move them to the purge tank. In the purge tank, we take them off feed for two days. On Thursdays, we deliver live to the grocery stores and we have um, insulated travel tanks that we load the fish into, weigh them out, and uh, deliver them to the stores. That was probably one of the harder parts, was just uh, creating our customer base 
And it was a lot of legwork and talking to other growers and where are the needs. Um, the Ohio Aquaculture Association has a nice network of, of people that helped put us in touch with stores that had needs and, uh, and just word of mouth from there. We walked into stores and, and, and we still do. We still do when, when we pass a little uh, ethnic store that looks like they might be a, a good customer. Um, might have a need for live tilapia. We'll just stop in and, and introduce ourselves and, and ask if they have an interest in live tilapia in their grocery store. Every week, we, are, we work very hard to create a consistent supply. When we started and we set some goals of what we wanted to accomplish, really our focus was on our family and how to take care of our family. And we put our kids to work and we gave them each assignments um, based on their natural abilities. So our son, who was an engineering student in college, helped us to draw design plans and put together um, the uh, framework of the business. And our daughter, who was in school to become a school teacher, put together all of the marketing for us, the videos, the website, all of that type of advertising and promotional aspects. She put together the tours for us. Um, and then our younger son, he was kind of our manual labor because he drew the short straw and was the one that was still living at home when we got to the point of construction. And so he did a lot of hands-on work side by side with his dad and uh, continued to do that as we grew. And so each of the kids had their hand in the business and that really was what we were focused on. At this point, our kids have now grown and graduated college and moved on. And so we have some hired hands that help us and we have goals of really growing this to a formidable business. Craig has since quit his full-time job. This is what we do full-time for him. And, uh, and we've been amazed that through hard work and a lot of support from people around us, including Ohio State and the OAA, we've been able to make this a business. And it feels good. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But we, we continue to be amazed that the opportunities come to us as we are trying and, um, and making ethical choices that the work comes to us. And, and we had no idea that ponds would be something that we would be interested in doing. We don't, we don't have ponds, but we sell fish to pond owners for pond stocking. That was a whole part of the business we didn't expect. And it's a real good part of the business. We look ahead and we think, you know, maybe we can do something with fertilizer. And um, we call it fish magic, our fish water that is our wastewater that we sell just to friends and neighbors to put in their gardens. And it works really well. So I don't know what we can do with that. We haven't really had time to explore that. But as far as defining success, I think doing the right thing for the right reasons has been our goal all along. And uh, we just kind of um, follow where God leads us. All right, if you're arriving at Ripple Rock Fish Farms, we are a 6,000 square foot building uh, located on our property. And as you come in the doors, we have shelves up high that have little white boxes. And those are the boxes the fish come in when we pick them up at the airport. We generally uh, order between five and 6,000 fry um, every six weeks. And when they arrive, we acclimate them in the fingerling system. We have three systems of fingerlings and we'll separate the cohort into a, over a couple different systems so that if we were to have a problem in one system, we don't lose a whole cohort. So they come in and we acclimate them into those tanks and um, they'll be in the fingerling system for about 16 weeks. As, they, um, as we get to that point, then we will sort them, we'll drain the tank and sort, sort, the, sort the fish and move them over to raceways for grow out. We have four raceways, 11,000 gallons each. 
As you look up in the building, there are um, oxygen PVC that runs oxygen throughout the building and into each of the systems, into the bioreactors and into the tanks themselves. If we were to lose power, we would begin losing fish after about 20 minutes. So we do have a generator outside the building that will automatically switch over in the event of a loss of power. We also have a monitoring system that records all of the temperatures in the tanks and the oxygen levels. And Craig has alarms that go to his phone so that he is aware of any issues that uh, drop below certain levels of temperature or oxygen. And because the facility is on our farm property, um, we're close. <laughs> and if it rings at night, it's his, it's his to get. So, um, so that's how the, uh, the emergency system is set up. Um, they do backwash every morning. So we come in and they'll backwash the systems and load the feeders for the day. We have a purge tank at the um, front of the building and that's where the fish will purge. They'll pull fish on Tuesday for delivery on Thursday and the fish will be held in the purge tank for a couple of days, uh, which helps with delivery and the taste of the end product. We have water storage in the corner uh, that's uh, operated with a, a sprinkler system so that we don't tax overtax the well. So it'll run for 20 minutes or so and then pause and, and let the well rest and then it'll run again. And the water then can get to room temperature throughout the day and then they'll <clears throat> use that water for the water exchange the next morning. We have feed storage in the back of the building um, that can be a little bit more temperature controlled and is not such a humid area. So we keep the feed back there. Uh, during the summer, we open the doors and windows and, and let the building air out a little bit. During the winter, we keep it all closed. The air temperature will closely match the water temperature. Like it'll be, it'll be in the 70s in the building, a little bit humid. <laughs> Uh, we have a heat transfer system uh, transferring heat into the tanks and then um, going back to the uh, water heater on the wall and just exchange that uh, cold water for some warm water and, and transfer back. That heat transfer system is also underneath the concrete so that helps to warm the building as well. So we are part of a feed co-op, the Ohio Aquaculture Co-op and uh, this is just a group of farmers that got together, fish farmers, to um, collaborate their purchase of feed so that we could buy in quantity and get uh, quantity discounts. And so they'll order about four times a year um, a, a semi load and this, they'll, the truck will arrive often to our farm and then one farm on the western side of Ohio and then the feed um, the growers will come and pick up the feed from those two locations. But it really has helped to um, keep our costs down. So when we started, we had one fingerling system and we raised about a thousand pounds that year. And we've grown gradually over the last eight years to the point where, you, where we are now at about 40,000 pounds this year. We hope to get to 50,000 pounds. And the way that has happened is really as we've learned um, how to keep our water quality where it needs to be so that we can feed what we need to feed. When we started, I think it was taking about um, 18 months to have a market ready tilapia. And we are down to about nine months, about 40 weeks um, from the fry to market size pound and a half tilapia. So that has happened really as we've gotten smarter on water quality. And Matt Smith has been instrumental in that in helping us learn how to better manage and keep track of our, our uh, water quality, our ammonia, our nitrites, and the relationship between nitrites and pH and, how, and ammonia and how, how we can um, keep the fish healthy. And uh, then the other thing that really helped us um, 
in our productivity is increasing our oxygen levels. We really struggled at first to, <clears throat> um, as densities would increase, our oxygen would go down to the point where we couldn't feed. And uh, then the, um, Craig got together with a couple other farmers and worked on a grant through the SAIR program, the Farmer Rancher Grant, to increase the oxygen. That made a huge difference for us in our productivity. I think we probably increased production by at least 30%. Um, and so we were able to raise more fish in the existing tanks and do it in a timely manner. So that's, that's really, um, we, we made some good progress there and that'll be documented here in the next six months or so uh, under SAIR uh, projects. As we began with our uh, SBIR project, we had professors really emphasizing that we needed to keep good records so that we could report on the progress of our um, project. And we have continued that. And our son has created a, an Excel spreadsheet that tracks the growth of the fish every week and what size feed they need. And it has printouts that the guys will go in every Friday and, and do a printout for the next week of how much feed, what size feed. And then they will record as they fill buckets, how many scoops they've put in, which equates to how many pounds of feed we're feeding in a week. So we record all of those records and keep track. Um, every day they also write down all of the results of chemical tests, the oxygen levels, the temperature, all of those from the YSI monitor and then from our uh, chemical tests. So we keep a record of all, all of the um, uh, water quality on a daily basis. This is the inventory of our fish farm on a dry erase board. So our daughter has a background in teaching school and she came up with this idea for us to keep track of the various cohorts as they come in our building. So this is a footprint of our building and the system. So we have fingerling A, fingerling B, and fingerling C. And then we have the four raceways. And so as a cohort comes into the building, as we pick them up at the airport, we fill out one of these. Uh, so for example, the November 5th cohort is right here. When they come into the building, they start off in the fingerling tanks up at the top. This is how many fish, 4,000 fish are in tank A2. They arrived on May 20th, 2021. And we'll just track them there. And as we sell fish, We'll change that number as we move fish then, we move them to raceways and there's the total number of fish in that raceway. The total for the building is up in the corner and then we track how many weeks uh, in the corner of the raceway. So this cohort arrived January 7th. There are 4,700 fish in this tank and there are 30 weeks. If I were to summarize our experience in the aquaculture business, going from knowing nothing about it as two city kids from Los Angeles to raising 40,000 pounds of tilapia a year, I would say that the things that we have learned is that it, there's a lot more to this business than just throwing feed to the fish each day. It is a lot of work. Uh, it's been very satisfying to see the growth and the progress that we've made and teaching our kids along the way how to run a business and all aspects of the business. We've really enjoyed sharing with the community. We do um, visits with schools and um, different tour groups and uh, rotary and, and we presented at a lot of different um, places and it's been fun to share the idea that we can produce something that is beneficial to the community. And so that's been very satisfying, but it is somewhat like owning a dairy farm. There has to be someone here every day. And if it's not us, it's our helper or our kids that have been trained. And it does take some patience because it's not something you can learn in a day. Yeah, it was, you know, we, we had help. We've had help along the way 
but yeah, it does, it does take a while before you feel like you can sleep at night. <laughs> but I would say the best advice we got was to start gradually. Don't take on more than you can handle at first and let it grow gradually. We've grown um, from a thousand pounds a year to 10,000 pounds a year to 15 and 20 to now 40. And that has been, um, a really good strategy to just do it a little at a time, get your feet wet and then um, get a handle on each aspect. So my husband explains fish farming as um, this idea that if you've ever seen anybody with those uh, poles and they're trying to keep plates spinning above them and they move from one plate to the other and keep trying to spin, that's kind of how he describes fish farming. You know, you're working on oxygen and once you get oxygen spinning just right, it, you know, you've got uh, chemicals that you've got to work on or filters that you got to work on. And it's just a matter of keeping all the plates spinning in the air at the same time and you move from one to the next. And uh, it's been exciting, it's been exhausting, and it's been very satisfying. <laughs>